spring. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure we'll have some more people hopping on the call, but I will start with some formal introductions. Thank you all for being here today. Um, if you don't know, Miss Melody Birmingham and Dr. Levon Esters went to high school together. And so this is kind of an exciting little reunion um, to get to share their experiences. They both um, have had an incredible um, careers and have done a lot for their communities um, to create um, better opportunities for people of color, for women, for people who are underrepresented in their um, fields. And so I'm very excited um, to hear this conversation today. I think it's gonna be wonderful. Um, and I'm gonna hand it off to one of Melody's um, host to introduce her formally and then um, Dr. Esters if you'd like to introduce yourself um, too I think that would be wonderful but I will hand it over to Jake. Hi everybody my name is Jake Scholes I am a junior currently double majoring in finance and accounting. Um, I am so grateful to be a host for the 70th anniversary of Purdue Old Masters. Um, kind of a little bit about Old Masters. Old Masters invites back distinguished alumni to elaborate on their Boilermaker experience and how this has led to great success in their career through panels and classroom talks and just one-on-ones with uh, professors and other people throughout Purdue University as well. Um, as a host for the Old Masters 2020 program, uh, I have the pleasure of hosting Ms. Melody Birmingham. Uh, Ms. Birmingham currently serves as the Senior Vice President of Supply Chain and Chief Procurement Officer for Duke Energy. Ms. Birmingham earned her Bachelor's of Science in Organizational Leadership and Management from Purdue University a master's of business administration from Strayer University, and she completed the advanced management program at Harvard University, but, or Harvard, Harvard Business School, my apologies. Ms. Birmingham received the Sagamore of the Wabash from Governor Holcomb, the state's highest award for civic contributions, and was inducted into the Craner Boiler Business Exchange Hall of Fame in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Melody Birmingham. Thank you very much, Jay. It's such a pleasure to be here and actually such an, an amazing honor for me to um, be back um, and this time uh, recognized as an old master. I never thought, you know, throughout my academic career, you know, just the level of um, appreciation that I would have seen um, as an alum from the university that, you know, everywhere I go, everywhere I, I've lived across the country, I try my best to represent. So it's definitely my honor to be here. Thank you, Jay. All right, uh, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Good. Uh, well, good morning. Well, no, good afternoon. Yeah, it is good morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is LeVon Esters. I'm a professor here at Purdue University. I'm in my office right now. I've been here now 12 years, um, uh, and so a lot of the work I do focuses around educational access and equity, uh, graduate student mentoring, and I focus a lot on uh, graduate students, unrepresented graduate students, so black and brown graduate students. And I also uh, co-lead, uh, co-director of the Mentoring at Purdue program, we like to call it MAP here at Purdue University. So I'm glad to see my colleague, Dr. Neil Knobloch, on the call today. He's the co-director. Uh, so we work together and have had that program in place for about eight years now. And um, we've done a lot of good work. And so I'm just excited to be here. And also, as was mentioned by Eva at the beginning, Melody and I, the connection we have is that we went to high school together. So we're both uh, from the city of Chicago. And um, so it's, it's, I don't know how to explain it. It's just interesting. And I've had people DM me and message me and text me about today's event and just being able to be here with her and, and to share in her success and, and to share her successes and how she got here with the rest of you all today is, is going to be exciting. So I'm looking forward to it, uh, to this today. Same here. And I can't tell you all how thrilled and proud I am of Dr. Esters as a former, well, I don't know if we can ever call ourselves former Eagles. We'll be Eagles for life. Right. Um, Lynn Bloom Technical High School. And so um, I'm just so thrilled and proud that he's at Purdue um, doing great things and helping students being, you know, a champion, um, you know, for our students as well as being a great mentor. So I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you as well. So Eve, I can just jump right into the questions. Is that, is that appropriate? Yeah, 
Go for okay. it. Okay. So I think what I would like to do, if, if you don't mind, uh, Melodies, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation, um, uh, and I bragged about you to some of my <laughs> friends and grad students, because you, of course you're worth bragging about, but I think what I want to do before I jump into some of these questions, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about journey, I think that would be appropriate for today so people can get a, a little understanding of how you got to this point. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, you, you went to Limbo High School with myself, but also talk about, you know, your choice to come to Purdue and then how that has contributed to where you are today. Absolutely. I'll be happy to do that. Um, and I am the first to tell you, you know, from where I started to where I am definitely wasn't a straight line. Um, a lot of twists and turns. So I grew up in the um, city of Chicago. I am the youngest of seven children and um, had the opportunity, you know, after graduating from a wonderful, you know, great high school of talented students um, that I had the privilege to um, get to know and some, you know, continue to keep in contact with. Um, I had a choice, you know, at the age of 17 of what I wanted to do with my life. And so uh, for me, the choice was easy. I definitely knew I wanted to continue my academic career and um, uh, uh, enroll in a university. And so now the choice was, okay, which university? Um, being the youngest child, I've been somewhat independent. And I'm also, many people don't realize this, I am an introvert. So, you know, you people from high school would probably say I was an introvert, but I am very introverted. Um, and so I really didn't um, see myself following a crowd, um, being independent and an independent thinker. You know, I wanted to identify a university that I thought would best fit me and meet um, uh, the needs that I had um, as a student who was going to pursue a career. Um, at the time, you know, growing up, I did not have access to a computer. Uh, we came up very humble means, and so I remember having a, a brother word processor. However, you couldn't do research on a brother word processor, so I, I went to what's now the Harold Washington Library, and I pulled from the Harold Washington Library. They had the various, um, I think it was the U.S. World Today, where they publish the rankings of different universities, and when you go through um, that research, you find out, you know, what the diversity um, um, makeup is, the demographic makeup is of the universities, as well as what's more important for me, the job placement rate. So my goal in going to college was to come out, you know, gainfully employed. That was the objective. Um, after doing the research, um, I found Purdue, and I don't know why I looked at Purdue at the time, um, but they had a very high job placement rate. That was important for me. Then once I started to uh, reach out to Purdue, I was contacted by, at the time, Dr. Cornell Bell. Um, if you ever heard the name Dr. Cornell Bell, he was a major force within the business school, um, the business opportunity program, also called BOP. And so um, I was interested in going into accounting um, I was very strong in um, math. We went to um, a technical high school, so STEM-based um, career was in my path. So reached out to Dr. Bell, and he was very excited to hear about my interest in Purdue, although the enrollment for BOP had expired. And so that wouldn't have been an opportunity for me to enter into the university as part of that program, but he just left such a great impression on me he represented Purdue, you know, in a way I had not heard anyone speak of the universe of a university. And um, I, you know, because he was also African American and he was able to speak to me directly as a young African American um, coming out of the city of Chicago, it really made me want to um, um, enroll in this university. So I applied for a number of universities. I was accepted to Spelman, Florida A&M, University of Wisconsin, University of Illinois, um, as well as three or four others. And I received scholarships, um, uh, about three full, full scholarships for some of those universities. Purdue was out of state for me, and it was one of the only universities I did not receive a scholarship. However, 
something told me this was the right university for me. I didn't know anyone from my high school planning or enrolled um, or who had applied to attend Purdue University. Um, the only thing I knew was what I had read during my research and the impact that Dr. Bell had on me. Um, so thus, you know, I, I was accepted into the university, decided to um, travel to West Lafayette. It wasn't too far from my family, but it was far enough for me to start this new life that I was starting as a 17 year old. Um, and so went into the School of Business, started my degree in accounting. And then later, I'll fast forward, um, later I changed my major because growing up in uh, my family, many of my family, including my parents, had worked in manufacturing. And I recall vividly, you know, just discussions that we would have or when they'd come home, my mom would come home, you know, just the, the grief, the, the frustration that uh, they would have as they spoke about their management, as they spoke about the working conditions not being conducive from a safety perspective, how they felt um, not feeling valued, and how they you know, portrayed the, the situations they were in and how they were being treated. So for me, I was in accounting, but I wanted to help make a difference. I wanted to provide what I thought um, employees with leadership they deserved. Um, I also wanted to be in an industry where I could directly um, influence and impact the outcomes, um, you know, be able to see at the end of the day, you know, the results um, and see the fruits of my, my labor. So um, I did change my major, as many students do, <clears throat> but this major, uh, when I changed it, I changed to move over um, into what's now the Polytechnic Institute. And I changed to the Polytechnic Institute because the big three at the time, they were hiring a lot of the graduates out of that school um, into various roles. And so for me, I wanted to go into manufacturing and I wanted to go in as a leader in manufacturing. Fast forward, fast forward, we'll skip all of the parties and all the fun I had in college. So fast forward. Um, I received a number of offers um, upon graduation or prior to graduation, and I keep, you know, I was sharing with the group earlier today, I'm, I'm not a pack rat, I'm, I'm very organized. So I have my great reports from Purdue as I shared with students last night, I still have those. I still have my offer letters um, from when I graduated. So I received offers from Harley Davidson in Wisconsin, from Motorola, um, and General Motors, and I decided that I would go um, to General Motors, um, which I did. So I moved from West Lafayette, and um, I graduated, you know, received the diploma cover, continue walking across the stage and left out of the building. I didn't wait for the rest of the commencement ceremony because I had to begin work the next week. Um, had my brand new shiny Toyota Celica hitched to the back of a U-Haul, to drive from West Lafayette to Rochester, New York. If you heard me, I said I had a brand new shiny Toyota Celica going to work for General Motors, upstate New York. So that's another story in and of itself. But um, I drove to one of my college uh, classmates. He decided that he would ride with me so I wouldn't have to take that drive by myself. So he actually, he rode there with me and flew back. Um, so I went to GM. My first job out of college was a frontline leader. I've always been in management. I've always been a people leader my entire career. So I've never had the, the benefit, some would say the pleasure or the privilege of being an individual contributor. I've always had responsibility for others. Um, and that's why I take my job, every job, especially where I have people who depend on me very seriously. Um, because the decisions that I make, you know, can impact, will impact not only um, the lives of those individuals, but their families. So I um, worked for GM, upstate New York, Rochester, <laughs> and I stayed there only a couple of years. I felt alone. You know, I, it was a great organization, a great company, as you all know, um, and it was what I wanted to do. However, again, I had no family, no friends, all the way upstate New York. Um, during the time I was at GM, I had a number of recruiters. They always contacted me for other opportunities. 
but one finally contacted me and um, asked if I would be interested in working for a German-based automotive company in North Carolina. Uh, my sister had just left uh, the Navy or was relocating from um, um, Washington to Florida with the Navy. And I thought at least if I had family nearby, you know, that would be better than being all the way upstate New York without any family. So I accepted the role um, in North Carolina for the German-based automotive uh, manufacturing um, company, GKN Automotive. And I transitioned there. I was also as, um, in that role as a frontline leader, a supervisor. And then over the course of years, I was uh, promoted a few times um, in that organization. Really enjoyed the job. I really loved North Carolina. And I had a, you know, the opportunity to at least um, have my sister visit North Carolina and me visit Florida as well. But then one of the executives from that company uh, who had left the company, he had retired, he had a colleague who worked in the electric um, utility um, in the Carolinas. And um, they were looking for someone to uh, help them start up a, um, an organization within their generation department. So uh, my former exec told this exec about me and they reached out to me and asked if I would be interested in interviewing for this position. Um, I had never considered leaving automotive manufacturing. I never considered going into electric utility. Um, however, you know, because I thought so highly of this exec who apparently thought highly of me, I decided to interview for the position. I interviewed for the position um, and I was asked if I would be interested in accepting it, which I did. It was still based in North Carolina. So I didn't have to relocate, um, took on that role. Um, and from there, that's where I started my um, career in the electric um, and gas utilities. I've been in this industry for 20 years now. So um, in this uh, industry, you know, I've worked across multiple departments. Um, I've relocated five or six times. So between North Carolina, South Carolina, and then, you know, South Carolina, I went back to Illinois. My mother had taken ill. So I went back to Illinois for a period of time and I was in the utility industry there. And then back to North Carolina, back to South Carolina, to Indiana and back to North Carolina. So that's why I said there was no straight line here. Um, I've worked as a maintenance superintendent at the power plants. Um, I've worked as a general manager over um, distribution operations. Um, I've worked as a director of transmission maintenance and construction, um, a vice president over distribution, construction, maintenance, operations, and engineering, um, senior vice president over Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, distribution operations, so that's construction, maintenance, operations, work management, project management, and then um, as president of Duke Energy Indiana, where I was prior to this role, where I was the state president for Indiana. And then in 2018, um, I was asked while I was state president if I would be interested in transitioning into a new role at the enterprise level, um, which is this organization that I now oversee, um, having responsibility for about about $15 billion of uh, third party spend that um, we um, engage in at the enterprise level for Duke Energy, um, which is now the role again that I'm in as the Senior Vice President of Supply Chain and Chief Procurement Officer. And that's for all of our legal entities for both our regulated and commercial businesses. So it wasn't a straight path. Um, you know, every position I was in, I learned something from the previous um, or the prior position that I was able to carry forward with me into the new position. Um, I've had amazing, amazing people, you know, along the way, amazing teams um, along the way who helped make my job a lot easier, you know, probably easier than I would have hoped for. Um, throughout my career, you know, I have been um, in many cases the only woman uh, the only African American, the only African American woman, um, the only Northerner or from the Midwest because I worked a, a large part of my career in the South between North Carolina and South Carolina. 
I was one of the youngest, you know, for me at that role uh, that I served in, I was very young compared to my peers. However, you know, with every one of the opportunities that were presented, I went into each of those jobs with a sense of humility, but also with a sense of confidence. You know, having left my family in Chicago and moving to um, Indiana, knowing absolutely no one, um, and being able to navigate, you know, through um, Purdue and graduate with offers, I had a sense of confidence and I had, you know, a belief that I could do anything um, as long as I didn't get in my own way. Uh, along the way, you know, I had great mentors and I would also say I had amazing sponsors, you know, because you can't do what I've done without having people who help you, you know, you just can't. Um, so I've had people who've helped me along the way. And, you know, with that, I've also committed myself to helping others as well. So it's been a fulfilling journey. And it's been one that, you know, whenever I'm asked to talk about it, you know, I get tired just thinking about everything that, you know, I've done, but I wasn't tired, you know, during that process of doing it. Um, over that period of time, you know, I was married and now I have two children. And I wasn't married, and I still have two children, so they didn't go anywhere. They're still hanging around. Um, and I raised my children. I went back to school. I got other degrees and other certifications while I was continuing to uh, move up in my career and um, raise my family. So that's my story. Along with the work, though, I will tell you, you know, because of what was instilled in me, the values that were instilled by especially my mother. I always tried to stay connected to those communities where I lived. <laughs> Volunteerism and philanthropy is um, important to me. You know, it's important to give where you live, um, whether that's giving your time, giving your talent, um, giving your resources, because we may not realize just how good we have it. You know, even on our worst day, you know, we have it better than many people. So I always try to keep that in perspective, even on days when I'm just worn out or things aren't going the way that I would have liked, I realize and I remind myself that people would love to have my problems. So I try to make sure that, you know, I give back to others and encourage and um, try to inspire others so they can also try to seek out to do what they may have thought was impossible. Uh, I don't know how to follow up with that. Uh, let me say a couple of things. One, I, I appreciate what you shared, Melody. That was a phenomenal story. Just say, uh, number one. Number two, if I didn't know any better, I would say you were peeking at my questions because a lot of what you shared address a lot of that which I'm going to ask you in a little bit. That's the second. Okay. Uh, the third, and so what I want to do is I want to try to get through as many questions as possible. I know I'm going to get through all of them questions for your for your own edification for those for the others career related they span across race and gender uh, mentoring of course leadership so those are the areas if you will those four buckets that I'm going to focus on today and so in light of what you just shared uh, I want to start out by asking you this question which I think is timely and appropriate personal qualities or personality traits and or dispositions have contributed most to the career success have achieved thus far and are there differences in what you have what you need now as you continue to climb the ladder versus when you first started your career yes okay so i say i would say the personal qualities or attributes again i i believe in in being humble um i truly know i can do a lot of things i don't have to tell everyone that you know, you don't have to, and I shared this with students yesterday, you don't have to walk in the room with your degree on your forehead for everyone to see it. You know, it comes through. Humble yourself to your organization. Allow others to help you know what they know. You know, allow them to share with you their knowledge because you can learn, believe it or not, from, from others in the organization, regardless what level they are in the organization. So humility is important to me. But at the same time, 
um, confidence is also very important because, you know, so oftentimes, and I'll just say this as a woman, uh, we often talk ourselves out of not pursuing a career or pursuing a position or an interest because we don't think we can, you know, we haven't seen other women do it, you know, is it ladylike, you know, does it appear too, you know, too manly? Um, and we may not feel as if we have all of the credentials and all of the experience, but if you have potential, if you have desire, if you have the right attitude, you know, those are transferable. Those are, those are, qualities, um, attributes that are transferable to many, many roles um, that you may be interested in pursuing. I've worked with so many men who never doubted themselves. They didn't doubt whether or not they could take on that new position or if they should be considered for the promotion. They would be insulted if they weren't asked. And so, you know, to not doubt yourself, to be confident, not cocky, but confident. And sometimes you have to build yourself up to that, be a cheerleader for yourself. I would say other qualities, of course, would be um, to be a good listener. You know, I believe in being a student of the business. Listen to the discussions that are happening around you. Listen to what's important to your employees, what's important to your CEO. What's important to your immediate manager? What's important to your customers? And if you listen and become a student of the business, you know, you can then be more responsive and more proactive in how you help um, support that business and advance the interests or objectives of that business. Um, I would also say to recognize that you don't have to have all of the answers. And this is something that I learned as I continued to progress in my career. You know, I am very hands-on. I'm very detail-oriented. I like to be involved in the tactical. That's immediate gratification. You know, that's when you can go home at the end of the day, you're physically worn out because you know you put in a good day's work for a good day's pay, you know, just that instant gratification. However, the higher up you go in the organization, you have to start to remove yourself from being the doer and be the person who provides the vision so others know what needs to be done. You have to be the one who is providing the resources and the structure and the leadership so others can do. Because if you're always the doer, you won't have, I would say, an organization, even a legacy of others who have that same um, um, ability um, or drive because you may not realize that you suppressed it. Unintentionally, you may have suppressed their drive or their ability to grow because you're always doing it. And sometimes it's easier to do it because you're more efficient in doing it. You know exactly what you want. You don't want the mistakes. There's a lot at risk, but you have to learn how to develop talent as a leader. So others can become just as, if not better than, hopefully better than you in the doing. So that way you can be a leader looking further ahead, being more strategic as opposed to being tactical in the weeds as, you know, the person who's, who's doing the work. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you for that response. So I imagine uh, I'm interested in, in learning more about this next question. I'm quite sure uh, those on this call do as well. Can you talk for a moment about what qualities you look for in a mentor and a mentee? Okay. Um, let me just, if I could start here, Dr. Esters, and say that I want to make sure we know the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. Yeah, please, please do. Yeah. An advisor. Do. They're yes. different. Okay. Yes. Yes. So a mentor is someone that you seek out. I would say they may be a subject matter expert in a particular area that you want to learn. They may be someone who can provide you feedback on how you show up, how you appear to others. 
someone who can give you very constructive feedback to help you close gaps. That's a mentor, okay? A sponsor, very different. You don't want the, the sponsor to see your gaps. So you want to work with your mentors to help you close the gaps so the sponsors don't see them. A sponsor is also what I would call a champion. They are an influential, credible champion. So when decisions are being made and your name comes up, they are one of the very few people in the room because not many people are in the room where sponsors sit. They're one of the people in the room who could say, oh, Jake, let me tell you about Jake. This is what Jake is capable of doing. Jake, although he hasn't performed these types of roles, Jake has transferable knowledge and skills, or we need to stretch Jake so he's prepared for the next opportunity. Jake deserves a promotion. That's a sponsor. Mentors can't do that. So now I'll answer your question. So what I look for in a mentor is someone who can complement the skills that I have. You know, they have skills or knowledge that I may have, but they are at a different level of understanding from where I am. And that's where I'm trying to get to that level of understanding. A mentor, I also look for someone who isn't afraid to tell me where I have flaws or gaps. This is someone who could tell me, Melody, whenever you're presenting, you never smile. People think you're so serious, you're so focused, that you're, you're, you aren't a personable, you're not personable. And I'm like, what? They don't know me. Do you know how the most personable person there is? Well, I know that, but no one else knows that. Or someone who, I would say one of the um, examples I use is when I became a uh, superintendent of maintenance in South Carolina. I was going in as the first female African American woman, had all, you know, white male electricians, INC technicians, operators, maintenance. They never, I was a unicorn, a unicorn, you hear me? Um, at the time when I was doing this. And so um, the administrative assistant, she was an older African-American lady, Cornelia Park. She told me, she said, Melody, all I ask you, she said, I'm so proud of you. All I ask you is that you um, allow them to see you for who you are, not what you know. And that, that impacted me in a way, and it stuck with me in a way. Um, to where I considered her to be a mentor, you know, someone who helps me understand how to navigate through, in, you know, circumstances, situations, people who may understand the political landscape that you don't, okay? So that's what I look for in a mentor. As a mentee, I look for someone who listens. I've had lots of mentees and they don't all listen, so those have been the most short-lived mentees I've had. I look for mentees who um, have a plan. You know, I'm not here to develop your plan for you. You come here with a, a plan. It could be a half-baked plan. Half-baked, that's why you're coming to me as a mentor, to help you finish baking it. Um, I look for mentors who um, can see themselves. They understand where they may have gaps or may have flaws because some mentees, I'm sorry, mentees, um, they can't see outside of themselves, you know, to be able to self-reflect and self-correct to where it's very difficult to get through to them and help provide them the feedback because they just don't get it. They can't see it. And I look for mentees who have, if not skill, they have will. If they don't have the aptitude at the time, they have the attitude. They have a fire in their belly, you know, a thirst for knowledge, um, a desire to learn, a desire to, to grow, and not look to grow only from a promotional perspective. So I've had individuals say, you know, I really want to become a supervisor. And my question to them is why? Well, I think it would be great to have a title and have people report to me. 
you don't need to be a supervisor. That's what I'll tell you. You don't need to be a supervisor. That isn't why you become a supervisor. Because as a supervisor, you are a servant leader. And you don't become a supervisor just for people to report to you and for the title. You're there to serve. You're there to lead. You're there to provide coaching, guidance, counseling. You're there to model the desired behaviors of an organization. And if you don't recognize that is the responsibility, you don't need to, to pursue that role. So I look for people who really understand what it is they want to do and why they want to do it. And who can take my constructive feedback? And that's one of the first questions. Do you really want me to tell you? Because if you don't really want to know, I'm not the right mentor. That's excellent. I appreciate that. So next, I want to ask you about this. And I just added something to this question. Um, what challenges have you experienced as a black woman in a leadership position? And how have you navigated or continue to navigate perhaps uh, some of those challenges? Yeah, um, I would say some of the challenges are, of course, you have perceptions, people's perceptions of black women. You know, just like there's angry black men, they think they're angry, emotional black women. You never see me sweat. I'll never sweat. You know, I may scream on the drive home, but you won't crack me. You won't break me in public. You know, and I do that for my own sanity, but also for other black women. Okay. Um, other challenges, I, you know what? I almost slipped up and call him LaVon. Dr. Esters, you know what? I have, I haven't backed down from a challenge. When I see something that appears to present conflict in my space, I go to the conflict. So if I see it brewing, I'm going over there before it, it, it continues to ferment because I want to nip it in the butt quickly. Um, and so I've, I've had to do that. I had, you know, this is a good example. I had um, an individual, I was moved into a new role. And um, this was a Caucasian male. And I will refer to, for my Caucasian male friends on this video, I will use that as an example because that's been my environment. But I've had Caucasian male sponsors and team members who have helped me tremendously. So just understand when I'm using this reference. So, but he was a Caucasian male. And he said, you know what? He said, you know, I like you. And I thought the only reason you got this job was because you were a black female. And I quickly responded, this is my little smart mouth, being the youngest of seven, that's why I always got punished as a child, just smart mouth. I said, well, you know what, I like you too. And I thought the only reason you got your job is because you're a white male and just nipped it in the butt. So I didn't hear those comments after that from the other white men because they knew if they had a snipe comment or remark, I had a response to just end it. Um, but I've been very fortunate that um, I don't want to say that people didn't challenge me because I was an African-American woman. They recognized that I was, and I knew that I was, and I never hit that. Very proud of who I am, who I represent, um, and celebrated it and helped them celebrate it as well. Um, I would also say that I probably presented more challenges for myself than others. Again, this gets back to that self-doubt, lack of confidence. How will they receive me? Okay. Do they see me as different? And I had to finally grow up and say, heck yes, they see you as different and they should because you are different. You're different in that you are younger. You are a female. You are African American. Heck, I'm in Tar Heel territory. I'm a bowl maker. Yeah, I'm different. So recognize that, accept it, embrace it, celebrate it, and let them see you shine with it on. So I've tried to take those things that would have challenged me and I took them. I took them over and then tried to make them to where they help empower me and help me, you know, fuel that fire that I needed to continue my progress. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I have two more questions and Eva, I'm going to then, uh, I wanna encourage everyone on this call today, please put in the chat any questions you have because Eva 
and Jake um, are going to uh, help me out today and feel those questions. So my next question, I actually wrote this down real time because I'm fascinated by this question. And this question is, um, Melody, is how do you build teams? You know, what are some of the keys? What are some of the things you've learned about building teams that have this we can do attitude, but also a part and parcel to that, you know, a culture where people can achieve as a collective and, and you reduce as best as possible some of the infighting that occurs within groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, throughout my career, I've had, you know, teams that were just high powered, um, self motivated team members. And I had some team members no one wanted. Everyone gave up on underdogs. So I love the underdogs because those are the ones that people give up on. And if people give up on underdogs, if I can turn them around, that's a reflection of me as a leader and a reflection of the potential and desire that people had that no one wanted to invest leadership capital. So I try to develop teams, first of all, you know, if it's one that I'm building up, you know, I've had to create my own teams and I've inherited some teams. By one, understanding them as individuals. Just because they're a team doesn't mean they all think the same. They all want the same things. What motivates them individually? I have some individuals who like public recognition, some who want no parts of it. I have some individuals who, you know, they have small children and, you know, they'll work long hours if I, I can allow them to take off to take the kids to school. And then I have others who work and will send you emails at three o'clock in the morning. And so just understanding that your team members are different and get to know them individually. So you know what their strengths are, what motivates them, as well as what their, their weaknesses are. Then I try to not put all of my stronger team members together. I try to cross pollinate pockets of the organization with stronger team members so they can help to um, complement some of those who aren't as strong. So if I have an engineer, a group of engineers, operator, and I don't know, construction team, I may mix them up. So at the end of the day, everyone knows something about everything. Um, I also set very high standards for my teams. Uh, whether or not you know it, people really want to do a good job. They want to impress you as their leader. They look for the same things that you do in making sure that they can be productive. Not many people that have had come to work to sit around. They really want to be productive. They want a reason to celebrate what they do. And it's kind of hard celebrating, you know, monotonous work, work that really doesn't challenge your mind or challenge your thinking and how you do things. They want something to celebrate. Um, and they want, to some extent, you know, you go to Maslow's hierarchy, they want to be recognized in, in those things that they do. If you're recognizing people for doing average work, then, you know, they recognize this is average work. So that really isn't gratifying. You know, it's almost, it comes across as an obligatory recognition. But when they know that you've given them a challenging assignment, you've given them the resources and support, and you allow them to use their creative freedom in order to complete the assignment, and it's beyond what they thought they were capable of doing, and they're able to do it, you see a different person show up. You see someone who's been able to tackle something that they never thought themselves they could tackle. They get that recognition. They're able to celebrate. You're getting discretionary effort from them because they feel good about what they're doing. So I look for people who want you know, to be stretched because I will stretch you, whether you want it or not. So I'm hoping you want it um, because just like you know, athletes, you stretch before you run. Just like a slingshot or a bow and arrow, you gotta stretch it before it can propel and accelerate. We have to stretch ourselves and our teams in order for them to be able to continue to progress and move forward and grow. Otherwise, they're static, you know, they're stale. Um, and when they're stale, they are less marketable. 
than others in the company or in the organization. And so I try to make sure I'm stretching them so my team are individuals that other people want. Um, and when there's conflict, again, I live in peace. I work in peace. I require peace. I require uh, a conducive work environment. I do not celebrate one person on the team without having opportunities to celebrate them all. Um, and I tell them, you know, divided we stand, united we, or united we stand, divided we fall. So we have to work together. You have to be careful as a leader as well to not pay too much attention to one or a few than to share that same level of um, attention with the rest of the team. Otherwise, that will only contribute to the conflict. When there is conflict, you must address it quickly. Otherwise, you will have um, a team that's less productive. You will have a team um, you know, that may result in doing things that will lead to their ultimate termination or others' termination. And it's just a poor reflection on you as a leader when you allow conflict in your own organization to continue to fester and go unaddressed. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm going to spend my questions because I have one in the chat right here from uh, Marquita Qualls. Thank you, uh, Dr. Qualls, for chiming in today. She says, greetings, great conversation and very timely. How do you say no to the things that are important to others, but not necessarily a priority for you? You know, that's a great question, Dr. Qualls. And I had to say no last week to something I was asked to do, but it didn't fit with um, what I saw I needed to do. And so I think you have to continue that sentence beyond the no. You have to say no because, and let them know why it's a no. It could be a soft no, it could be a firm no. If it's a soft no, it's no, not now. You know, I, I may have a number of things I have to get done that are higher priority, or this really isn't in line with, you know, the objectives that we've already set out, or we don't have the capacity to take this other thing on. Now, right now. Or it could be a firm no, no, not interested. And I'm not interested because it really doesn't help me grow as a professional or no, great example, my mother, and this is just how I was raised. Um, after she uh, lost her job, the union went on strike, the company sent the operation to Mexico. So she had to find other employment. One of the jobs that she was offered, Dr. Qualls, and this is the example I had, was a really good paying job as a conductor for the CTA uh, L. On, in Chicago, we have the trains and the L's, and so it was the L. Um, but for this position, you know, she was required to wear pants, can't wear a skirt. I grew up in a very strong faith-based family. My mother was a um, very Christian Sunday school teacher, mother of the, the church, and she had not worn pants. So she, told them, no, I can't go against my faith because this is my faith. I don't want to wear pants and I do need a job. However, no, she walked away from that. I saw that growing up. So I know the power of values. I know the power of prioritizing what's important. I know even when you have a family to feed, you know within yourself that, you know, there are other options that are available to me. So I'm, you know, I'm able to say no. Um, and that's why I feel comfortable doing it. Now, I take on a lot. I take on, I do a lot. I do a lot. So I would say I don't say no often, but when I do, people realize that that's a real firm no. Thank you. Again, if you have questions, please place them in the chat um, until I see one pop up. I have a, a very easy question. Uh, do you have any favorite books focused on leadership and career fortitude that you've read or are reading now that you may want to share with folks on the call today? Yeah, I, I have a lot of books um, that I've read on leadership. Uh, one was um, Mulvaney. He was the CEO of Ford. 
and he talked about how he turned Ford around. If you remember when we were going through the bailout, the auto bailout, Ford was one of the only companies that did not take that bailout. Um, and he talked about what he did to develop leaders, having goals, having KPIs. People had so much waste in their operation, but they had become accustomed to having it, so they didn't even recognize it. So that was a book, you know, that really left a lasting impression on me. Um, I read a lot of sports, you know, by um, coaches from different coaches. Um, I have I have a couple right now. I'm in the middle of reading. Um, Deep Work, this is one I'm starting, and it's Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World. Can you describe where we are right now? If not distracted, <laughs> what are we? Um, yeah, a, wee bit, a wee bit distracted, right? A wee bit distracted, as some of us probably have one eye on the screen and the other eye probably waiting for results. Um, but yeah, this is one I'm starting to read, but another one I'll tell you about, and I actually purchased um, a lot of copies of this book, and I invited the author to meet with a group of African-American employees. Actually, it wasn't just African-American employees, um, but it's called Change Agent by Jim Lawry. Um, and this book is, the, the subtitle is A Life Dedicated to Creating Wealth for Minorities. Um, Jim Laurie is an amazing person. He um, actually grew up in Chicago as well. Um, he went on to do great work in the Peace Corps. He worked on Wall Street. He was an entrepreneur. And now he is a, uh, he's a consultant for Boston Consulting Group. Um, and he wrote this book just talking about, you know, what African Americans need to do to really help um, provide economic, um, and I'm saying African Americans, it says minorities, but it, it was written by an African American, so that's primarily who it's targeted towards. And I've read, you know, I've read books, books for women as well. Um, but I like this because as we talk about social injustice and racial um, inequities, in order to become equal or have equity, you need economic empowerment, okay? And so, and that goes for women, that goes for men. You need to feel economically empowered. And so this book is something that I've always believed. This is what I try to share with others I know, with my children, my family, and he wrote about it in a way, coming from someone who is an expert on Wall Street that I had to share with our employees and had them read the book as well. Just so they understood that, you know, you don't have to be a victim to your circumstance. If you focus on becoming more empowered economically, it gives you all types of freedoms to where you can pursue other opportunities or you can give back to your community or support the efforts of your church or pursue an entrepreneur opportunity that you may not have thought that you um, would be able to do. So those are just a couple, but there are quite a few. I love learning about investing. Um, I love, you know, I'm a big saver. I learned that from um, my mother growing up. So I, I read a lot of financial books, leadership books. I've read a lot of leadership books, but I really try to live it out. I learned a lot about leadership, you know, just through my degree and through practice, you know, being a leader since my first job out of college. Thank you. So Sarah and Jake, this will be my last question. I'll turn it back over to you. Um, the question is from Sarah, uh, Coach Jack. I hope I said that correctly, if not, I apologize. What advice do you have for a Purdue senior graduating in May 2021 heading into the workforce? Great, congratulations, um, um, Sarah, if you are that senior. I would say, um, aside from your educational background, your degree, make sure you develop soft skills. You know, oftentimes our students, they come in with their credentials and their degrees, but they aren't effective communicators. Um, they may not know the power and benefit of networking. Start doing that now while you're in college so that you can become more comfortable when you go into the workplace. Um, also, once you go into the workplace, save your first job if you have a 401k program or um, a, a retirement program 
as much as you can put into that program from the very first paycheck, start doing it immediately and then forget about it. Um, so you live off of the net. You will not regret doing that when you turn 50. Um, you'll be a multimillionaire by that time if the market continues. That's the, the beauty of compounding and dividend reinvestment. Um, also, again, as I stated earlier, become a student of the business that you're going in. So before you even, you know, get to that first job, make sure you read the news articles. You can Google anything these days. Learn more about the company. You know, what products and services they sell, where they operate. Learn more about the leadership team, who serves on the board. Go to their SEC filings to look at the 10Q and the, you know, and the um, 10K to learn how they're making money, where they're making money, where they're losing money. Learn about that. So when you are there as an employee, you know how you can help support the overall objectives of the company and its stakeholders. And then I would say go in uh, with the desire to learn from others, be approachable, be likable, uh, but don't spend so much time trying to be liked that you're not focused on doing your job well. So do your job well, you know, dig your heels in and do it really, really well, uh, but you can continue doing it well, you know, while you're working on building relationships, networking, and, um, you know, people liking you in the process. Thank you. Well, Eva and Jake, if I may, before I hand it back over to you all to close out, let me just say, Melody, I thoroughly enjoyed this. This is literally, I'm glad Eva, we decided to record this because this is, I'm going to show this video with Melly's permission to classes that I teach my grad courses because this was like a leadership course, a one hour. Uh, it was amazing. So thank you, Melly, so much. People in the chat uh, shouting you out and thanking you as well. So I just want to say thank you for the opportunity today. Glad to see a fellow Eagle, which is everyone we go by. And that's a, yes, um, high school. I see Eagles fly. And, yeah, we do fly. And you're soaring beyond wow. what, anyone's wildest dreams, myself included. So just continue to do what you're doing. So Eva and Jake, I'll turn it back over to you. Yes. So a big thank you um, to you, Dr. Esters, for today as well. I have like three pages of notes that I've been taking, um, but you facilitated a wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful for both of you for your time today on a Friday. Um, and if you guys really enjoyed this call, if you check out all of our Old Masters social media pages, we have a big panel event called Evening with the Old Masters on Monday night at 7 p.m. It'll be live streamed on YouTube and you'll get to hear from more from Melody and from our seven other wonderful, wonderful old masters. But I just, again, want to thank you guys. This was really wonderful. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful Friday. And you all be well, everyone. Thank you very much and stay safe. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, guys. Bye.